Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I think I don't need this. It's really an honor and pleasure to speak in honor of David Blackwell. So I think Daniel like that, like the same picture. Uh, so oh, when I was a graduate student in the late eighties, I remember reading my interview by David Blackwell. It's probably around 1986. It's not exactly the same code, but in spirit it was the same about simplicity. And that stuck in my mind. It's both about understanding. David said that I'm not interested in doing research. I never have been. I'm interested in understanding, which is quite a different thing. I'm open to understand something you have to work out yourself because no one else has done it. And there's another quote. That's what I remembered from Daily Cal. Always look for the simplest solution. So to me, there have been the North Star for my research, understanding and simplicity. So let's look at one quote from our former Chancellor Al Boker about Davis' teaching. He said his ideal faculty member, first and foremost, is an excellent classroom performer. I will show you a little clip to show you uh, what actually David does in class. I'm really regretting that. When I was a graduate student, he was still teaching the Beijing statistics class that was at 8 a.m. <laughs> Neyman had at nine, I could make it, for, but I didn't make it, it's really regret. Um, his classes have both been rigorous and popular, and he was also listed as supervised many. Despite the fact that he was at 8 a.m., he was popular. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get the best students. <laughs> I, think, I think if you, as good as David, you can have a class anytime. I want to just see this book. I think it's really based in statistics. He called basic statistics and that's the whole preface, just half a page. So I think I'll let you read it, let David speak for himself. This is so all right that, you know, kids have forgotten high school algebra and say exactly what he would do in a very short, concise and elegant way. And in the end, he said Beijing. He didn't put in the title. There was a later book by uh, Barry, I think did that. So that's kind of David's style in his own world. And now we have a building in honor of David. And that's his family, two generations. And if you want to Google it, it's not far. And this portrait of David actually was donated by a former student, uh, Richard Davis. So he was extremely popular as an uh, undergraduate professor. And here's some quotes from his first PhD student, he said to David Blackwell, who with his characteristically concise sentence told me among other things, how to write a mathematical paper, how to look at mathematics, how to welcome responsibility and how to face one's more mature years. That's what I need. This paper is affectionately dedicated. I wish David is around to tell me how to live my mature years. <laughs> Maybe Peter will tell me. And another student who, I think David had more than 50, like 65. So David gave a talk at Stanford Berkeley Colloquium, which is still going. And he described certain, I think it's about something called programmable sets. And he, which is Richard was amazed by how clear easy it was trying to tell everyone about it. So quickly that lecture was a very clear representation of something not so easy at all. And David had the <laughs> capacity to organize argument far, far better than I. The idea is simple as it described. And other people who didn't work with him, there was this wonderful volume called A Tribute to David Blackwell. So David Blackwell was a teacher without parallel. I was particularly impressed by how he could make truly deep concept transparent. Simplicity is not because it's actually simple, it's because you understand so well that it becomes simple. It's a lot of work, even to the beginner. Indeed, that that was such that understanding sometimes blossomed mysteriously and gradually. I recall doing over class notes after class and only then begin to understand how deep and subtle some of the concepts he had presented were. I just enjoy remind myself how wonderful David was. Oh, this is going the wrong way. And there was also a very good interview by uh, Maurice de Groot of a conversation with David Blackwell. And in the interview, Maurice asked him, what's 
your favorite paper. So let's hear David. My first the paper was called on an equation word. Grew up after the original conversation with Abe, Gershak was really a mentor for many, many years for David. This is a paper I'm still very proud of. It gave me pleasant feelings. So let's all remember that one old mature years, which papers give us warm feelings. And this is really good to know whether you remember you know, overproduced papers. Then I don't think that's what David would suggest we do. And so what the main idea for one thing was proof of word theorem under I think weaker conditions had been true before under sort of natural conditions. And he said, the proof is neat. And he went to the blackboard and here's from the interview, I just um, cut and paste it. I didn't see this uh, proof before I learned it some other way. You just replicate the stopping time many, many times, have this S1, SK, and then you just write it out. This is trivial and use lower larger numbers. That's it. <laughs> I definitely didn't learn this in class. So this is just neat. I completely agree. It's just so intuitive and so simple. And we don't need all these fancy things that we used to learn to prove it. So in terms of intellectual um, overlap, David and I did overlap, which I learned more from David on the topic of information theory. This is just very nice website. It's all David's papers. And in particular, you see two papers with two colleagues. Oh, I think Leo Bryman was a student and a colleague, Tomation. And there was this interview with Leo Bryman about the history of how, why Bryman proved the theorem. Actually, the idea came from David. Leo Bryman said that we used to sit in seminars. He would send me this little note saying, can you prove this and this and this? And one of the notes he sends, they were like, can you prove this thing converge almost surely to the following? I'm sure probably the entropy or Gaudic theorem. And I thought about it for the next couple of days. And then I said, yes, I can do that. I can see how to do that. So that became the Shannon Bryman Macmillan theorem, which is for entropy convergence for ergodic processes. And David for Black Bryman was an incredible inspiration person to work with, to see his mind work was to fit. Of course, Leo himself was really a giant himself, but you can see all these giant minds really uh, interacted. And for me, I didn't really get to know David as a graduate student, admire him tremendously, but didn't really interact with him. And I came back as a assistant professor in the early nineties. And then I started interacting with David more. And this is a photo from an attribute to Blackwell and even see myself, I didn't know this, there was such a photo. And David Blinger, who was another uh, giant from statistics said that being David's colleague has been a privilege and I fully heartedly, heartedly agree with David. His honors and accomplishment listed here are but a few of many in the arbitrary. And you can see many colleagues, Eric Lehman, Ching Tri Chang, and Carrie Kaufman, and Julie Schaefer. So this was one of the, the department used to have a birthday party for everybody in the same month. Maybe you should revive that. I think there was a pay, um, uh, some same photo with Peter and Eric and David. So my interactions with uh, David Blackwell after I came back was a lot of bumping into him in the morning um, around eight, if I come in early, going the side of Evans Hall. And we'll go to the third floor and check out the mails and that's what he would go or we encounter him in the elevator. So a lot of elevator and hallway talks and Christmas party. He will always bring this eggnog, very strong liquor in it. And so every Christmas party, I don't think I tried much. I probably tried it once. And during my difficult times, I could always turn to David for support. He was always just so warm and matter of fact, and a tremendous, and I was able to get David to drive me to a conference in UC Santa Cruz. So we had long rise uh, conference on online prediction of individual sequences by the Hausler and Wormers. Actually, I have to reach out to you up front <coughs> to help remind me exactly what's the topic. I remember more the conversations than the topic of the conference. So in one of the rides, I think I was going through some difficult times and I said, what David gone through must be just like different magnitudes. So I asked him, I said, David, how do you deal with it? 
And that's what he said. He said, the people who help you and people who don't, that's fair. So he was very, very calm and never really made me feel like, I'm sure all the tremendous difficulties, he just didn't show. And other things I took away from David in my conversation with him, which I very much agree with the first one, we shall hire top young people into tenure track and tenure them unless something goes really wrong. That will really remove all the pressures of publishing over production papers these days. And the other one is that because I was teaching information theory class and wanted David to speak to my class or to my group, I forgot which it was, and he refused. He would say that it's your time and not my time. He was so clear. And I remind myself, I took some of my younger colleagues that just tell me to get off, right? If I get to a stage that you think I should go, but I don't want to go. So it's don't overstay your time. So I thought it was very, very wise. What? <laughs> David was David was maybe a little older, but I'm just wanting to take the wisdom from David and to um, prevent myself doing something I actually my rational mind wouldn't want to do. And when David passed away, I was actually the department chair. And I had really the privilege to work with his kids and got to know some of them. And uh, to prepare for this uh, memorial we did in I House. And in the process preparing for that, I really learned more about David. There was this wonderful oral history with four sessions by this person from the bankrupt library. Nadine Womond, and it's on the internet. I really encourage you to read it. One thing I was surprised when I read this oral history after David passed away was that David was a genius and why we don't see this word used on David as much as should have been. So I was so surprised to learn that he learned reading by going to his uncle's grocery store. Just look at those goods, potato and the bag. How many of us could figure that out? I was so impressed that. Um, so I want this story to be known that you can learn just by going to a grocery store. And in the same interview, he also talked about the motivation of game theory work. I think this is the theme of this semester, which is again, Gershuk played a role because he was in Washington during the war and working with a unit called Operation Research Office in Washington. And he was working on game theory and optimization theory. And it was very much war uh, efforts related. And David, I think I'm sure you guys can tell me that actually I'm useful in practice too, but David saw that he was just doing it for the sake of beautiful mathematics. And let me share more uh, words from his students in this uh, collection called After He Passed Away, a tribute to David Blackwell. So George Russes, I also know who was a student here and professor at UC Davis. And he, I think, characterized David as a person in the most concise and simplistic way. Professor Blackwell's personality was overwhelmingly strong and yet gentle and enchanting, radiating kindness around him. I think that's the people who know David would agree. And Herbert Lowe, I think was a student of him, said something, also give you a little detail about how David was alike. David is true, he always uh, wear similar jacket, like whitish. And Joe Oldcar, and he was not that interested in teaching graduate courses. He was interested in more teaching undergraduate courses. That's where his impact was. And I missed my chance, uh, couldn't get up at eight. And more comments from this attribute to David Blackwell. And Professor Maiden Peru said that a sense of pride that David was a rare individual who possessed warmth, integrity, humility, intellectual passion, a commitment to students, faculty, colleagues, and friends alike. He had another paragraph about how great friend David was. 
he had the courage to take a stand on important issues. That's, I think, hugely important in today's world. The qualities that a creative gifted scholar imbued with high moral sense is supposed to possess. I think we should put that on our faculty evaluation. And we're fortunate that we had such a person as our colleague. I return to the theme of simplicity. A colleague, um, Julie Schaefer said, he liked elegance and simplicity. Issues had to be clear in the very simplicity of situations. So he didn't like empirical biases because it kind of mixed up a very clear, coherent uh, framework. I remember David telling me that real Bayesians as people, which I very agree, much agree with. It's really the, the analytical priors I some probably differ with David. Empirical Bayes didn't meet his test. He felt a Bayesian pride was necessary. His ability to clarify issues in simple, elegant ways was presumably what made him such an outstanding lecture and teacher. So the understanding and the effort and also simplicity, they all connected. So back, I will call this actually a given name, Blackwell's Way understanding and simplicity, and my favorite photo, David. Of course, simplicity has been a philosophy science for decades, or so not centuries. And my connection to simplicity, actually I did a thesis on MDL, which is a quantification of simplicity using information theory. And I would think that, I think I started working on information in 1987 with Terry Speed, and I remember reading about simplicity with David's comment, probably 1986. So there was some connection which I couldn't completely remember. I still pursue simplicity to this day. And oops, okay, that's right. So it's in terms of algorithms. So we have algorithms to make decisions on whom to get CT scan, whom to give loans to, whom to give job interviews to, whom to grant parole to. And both understanding and simplicity are very much in need in these situations for inter learning. And decision trees actually quite simple. I'm not sure it's always gives us understanding. That's what you have to put in the context to do. But at least among all the machine learning algorithms, decision trees are simple, interpretable, and I'm hoping will bring understanding as well. Can be visualized, implemented, and mirror ways people think. And so you can look at errors and biases more accessibly, and maybe fix a human in the loop flow and instills trust and distrust it on the model we uh, develop. So we have been working very closely with people in um, UCSF. I have my former student now, MSR, Chandan Singh and Aaron Complis. I mean, Chandan made this slide. I don't have the ability to do that. And we really try to help ER doctors to decide when to send an injured child, say abdominal injury, to a CT or not. On one hand, if you send to CT, it can be over radiation, and you also don't want to miss uh, internal bleeding. So this is the trade off we, we're dealing with. And decision trees are building blocks of random forest and gradient boost, boosting, right? This is something that um, have very good performance. But if you look at decision trees, we have a gap. Decision trees don't work as well as random forest or XC boosting. And can we bridge the gap and keep the simplicity? So for the next part, I'll tell you um, a lower bound result to show that when you have additive structures, decision trees cannot reach optimal rate and using actually information theory. So that's kind of cool. Connect with Davis' work, not exactly, but um, at least information theory. And the second part, can we have to build in some additive structure to have additive trees and to bridge both words of simplicity and also to be able to um, capture the additive structure. So this is the team of people I work with. And um, Yan Shu Tao, now National University of Singapore. Kei Yan, now working for Google, a master's in China, introduced, and Abby is a current student in statistics. So if you look at decision tree theory, there's a tree, and there are kind of three branches. One is feature importance. Can you get something important of a gene or a factor out? So it's a whole line of work on that. 
Oh, point wide convergence, right? Can you look at the point as a non parameter estimation and get some consistency in rates for uh, card and random forest? Oh, point wide asymptotic normality. So they are kind of three branches. None of them address the question or give direct understanding why decision tree don't work so well in practice. So, what we try to do is to really bring that insight that additive structures actually not the best fit for decision tree. So here's a simulated model without even noise. You have additive Boolean functions, and then you do a decision tree, it will end up doing, try to match because the additivity have to do many splits on uh, X3 to accommodate the fact that this additivity. And you look at the performance, you see a performance drop. Right, you can simulate model with the additive structures. You just see that things don't work as well as you show in the Boolean example. But we do want to do additive models, right? I hope you all agree. And here's a reason. Actually, many real world data sets actually have additive structure, and we have success with least squares right and left. And there's a lot of non parametric annihilations of these squares from the 80s. And we want to understand why decision tree don't work. So here's a simple um, model. You have data on the cube because random forest and trees is really monotonic, uh, trend, like invariant. So this is not too restricted assumption just for math to go more simply. And we assume that you have editing model and the editing model has to be a little smooth and you look at all possible trees. So this is a lower bound result. It's not an uh, upper bound result. And then you can show that you have this lower bound. Take any tree you want, Oracle or not, you have this rate. And actually it happens that early work from my student and Martin Wright, we had the optimal rate for this class. But you have each individual component to have some smoothness. And you match, unless S is one, basically one, one component, or it's not really additive, these two rates don't match. So this really explains that there's something missing if you do trace and you have additive structure. So the proof I won't have time to go to is a bias variance decomposition. You see a little bit of that in the earlier talk, actually. And you, you map the trees as lossy codes, and you do rate distortion theory in information theory to get the code, to get the lower bound. So back to this example where you have a problem, right? You, you, you over split on X3 to accommodate for the additive structure. So what we do, grow multiple trees, bring additivity into the game or disentangle the different effect through additivity. And so that we can adapt to high order interactions. So I've also been working on decision a lot with genomics problems. That's also a very good fit with random forest, but this is more for interval uh, like clinical use. So we want to control the complexity. We don't want to have too many splits or we aim for simplicity. And we actually can see compared with decision trees, we can improve prediction performance. And we therefore fewer false discoveries. So on the other line research my group does, we really want to do recommendations for knockdown experiments. So we don't like false discoveries. We want high yields. And with all of that, we introduced the fast integral greedy tree sums fix. Genius of my students. <laughs> and we modify high level the cart spread to grow a flexible number of trees simultaneously and control the total number split among the addition. And we do backfitting because when you have additive structure, you should use the residuals to when you feed new components. So this is the card algorithm, if you're not familiar. What you do, you have say three predictors and you look for, go through one by one and see if I do a split and feed a constant after you do the split, which one give you the big reduction of these squares, arrow. And then you do split and you do two card again. They, they don't get connection anymore. And you look, and that's what you end up with. Even you have a simple um, Boolean additive model, you end up with more than you need. 
So how about fix? Fix is very much just building on cart. The first one, just like cart. And then for the second one, you have the choice of splitting with the first one or add a node. And then you consider all three of them and you look at, use the refitted, uh, the residuals for each component, you compare the job and then you choose one. So it's coordinated cross all splits. And then you might not, you might want to keep splitting without doing an additive component and you just go. So it's very simple. It's very easy to explain. And then we get runtime. We do take more computation time, but it's only R times. R is the number of splits you want to do, which is under your control. So it's, so it's like a multiplicative compared with the uh, cart runtime. And the results, we improve prediction performance and keep simplicity as much as we can. And with this entangle additive components. Yes. So at a very high level, why like making this additive is a good idea? Remember, we show that if you the data have additive structure, the trees has mismatch optimal like us uh, has sub optimal rate. So it shows that trees is not to accommodate additive structure in your data. And we believe that in practice there are a lot of cases that you have additive structure. Yeah, that's what I try to make right. So the square works all of that. So I'll show you that this is a bunch of um, public data sets. And you will see that with both regression and also um, classification, then this is the data. I only show you classification as similar that. You basically have a lift of about 10% across different data sets. If you look at this, recidivism is by pro that actually random forest doesn't work. This is really have discrete structure. But even look at all the different discrete, this is all different like discrete structure, cart or decision trees, and we have a whole lift of performance. And here you can see that we have too many, we lose it, but when you have one really, really simple explanations, you see a lift of performance. So this is shows that I have another panel I won't show you just in the interest of time for regression, similar performance. And let's dig into something which we get some understanding. So this is a particular data diabetes classification data set. And if you do CART, you have AUC, which is the area under the curve, about 81%. And you get eight, if I count it right, nodes, right? That's just the split for making this prediction. If you use fix, this is actually two splits of two. We're not doing three splits, but we write it into one. And you only end up with five. And you get tiny, this is not major, but you don't lose. So this is shows that you can really simplify things for understanding too. This probably has some additive structure for this data. The decision trees just have to accommodate by making more and more split. And here you have simple things. And then for the different additive trees, we have a follow-up paper I won't have to get to. You can also imagine that each tree is characterizing a different heterogeneous subpopulation of disease mechanisms that they don't fit together. And then you have scores adding up. So each tree gives you a score and you add up the scores for each tree. Okay. So that's what they're saying that you can have predicted risk of one is on plasma glucose and the other is based on BMI, the other on age, you just add them up and then that's, you get a predicted risk score. Yeah. Difference from something like staying with that you're not saying, or you're not taking a convex combination of the trees, you're just literally adding. Yeah, the item is different. We do end up with different. And the way we use the previous information is also different. So we use it through uh, the residuals, right? And boosting does too, but then you do reweighting. And X boost, we actually have a follow up paper we, we, we compare is that we sometimes do better than X boost. Sometimes uh, we need to use more nodes to reach the performance. But there, for some data, we can keep the simplicity. But also so um, we do have a, but I don't have time yet. Thanks for the question. So back to um, 
Mm. I would say uh, ubiquitous presence of algorithm now in our life, especially for high stakes decision making. I would call, I would say black hole's way emphasizing understanding and simplicity, both of which have big roles to play in making algorithm safe. And to return to what I started with about Blackwell being a master teacher, I'd like to quote a historian, a statistical history, uh, historian Steve Stigler Stiegler from uh, University of Chicago, who was a student at Berkeley, I think in the 70s or 60s. I mean, I'll just let you read what uh, Steve said. He's a very, very good writer. Um, what reference is that to? Um, a tribute to David Blackwell. Which is what? Book? It's a collection of notices from American uh, Mathematical Society. I have that in the last slide, yeah. So it's after David passed away. Uh, George Russo's edited this. Um, I think you had a piece. I did. Yeah. Everybody was asked to write a one to one, like half a page. And from former students advised by him to students at Berkeley and colleagues, about 20, I think, uh, attributes. What can definitely, I think, especially struck me was that. His mastery came from the way he was thinking through the material with us at our speed and making his thoughts our thoughts. And then this is, if any secret to this. And it was a magic and a lasting magic since the knowledge in part remained with us. So just to give you a sense into the magic. I found this video clip. I find how to press it. It was a video made when David was awarded the National Medal of Science after he passed away. I think Peter was one of the nominators that uh, made that happen. Uh, that's David's voice. Can you hear? In the mid-50s, Blackwell joined and soon after headed the University of California, Berkeley's newly created statistics department. Over the years, Blackwell continued to expand mathematics by introducing game theory, decision theory, and information theory into the field. That's the problem in particular that we knew that all these axioms were greater than or equal to a half. David Blackwell, the first African-American elected to the National Academy of Sciences, dedicated to assisting disadvantaged students in the U.S. and Africa. First, the advice I would give to young people generally is try everything and keep looking until you find something that you like. Hope you find time to watch the whole video. Suppose that every day. So the references are here. Thank you. Well, you want to take a, a couple of questions before we break for lunch? Okay, so let's let's wrap up here, and uh, we'll meet back at two o'clock back on schedule uh, for the afternoon. Uh, and so uh, see everybody then. Thank you. Thank you.